God is a faithful God. In fact, he can't be anything but faithful, and we are so glad of that, and we are so glad that you have joined us here on Hope Today. We're going to talk about a faithful God. We're going to talk about how we can touch others with his love. So I'm Tom Hollis, and this is Amanda Brocker. Amanda, we have a guest that's going to help us with that. We sure do. We have Pastor Terry Christ, and we are excited about this. You know, he's going to help us to learn how where there are walls, we can actually build bridges. And don't you desire for to, you know, just be an influence in our community? This is what we're going to learn. So if you work within your community, if you're part of the body of Christ, you need to call up a sister or a brother and say, hey, tune into Cornerstone Television for this guest. You know, the gospel is good news. Sometimes it's hard to get the good news part out. You know, there's so many barriers and things, and I know that Pastor Terry is going to help us with that. We're going to learn how we should love one another today on this program. We're going to discover what you can learn from Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well, one of my favorite portions of scripture. We're going to dig into that. We're going to explore three practical ways to live out radical kindness. Think about that. You know, if, the, if it's the good news, the gospel's the good news, then uh, putting that together with radical kindness, That's what right. a great presentation that is to someone. I know. You, you're not going to want to miss a second of this program. So get your tea, your coffee, whatever snack you have, because you're going to want to really sit down and hear the word of the Lord. I believe this is revelation for this hour, even with, you know, politics and everything that is presenting itself to us right now in this day and age. I know, and there's so much, and but... You know, again, I go back to that good news, that aspect of good news and bringing that good news to someone. You know, you all, you all have people in our, your life, we all do, that have uh, either walked away from Christ or you're trying to bring them to Christ and, and bringing that good news with kindness. Uh, what a fantastic way to draw them in and that's what we're, we're called to do. That's right. So sometimes it's not the easiest thing to do when you have differences with someone else, but it is possible and we need to walk in that love of Jesus. Well, in a world marked by increasing division, our next guest offers a compelling solution that is marked by unity and transformation. Terry Christ is the co-lead pastor of City of Grace in Phoenix, Arizona, and he has also written a new book called Loving Samaritans, Radical Kindness in an Us versus them world. He joins us now to share how we can better love one another without having to compromise our beliefs. Pastor Terry, welcome to Hope Today. Hey guys, thank you for the privilege of being with you here today along with your viewers on Hope Today. I've been looking forward to our conversation for some time. Amen. Well, thank you for writing this amazing book. I believe that everybody needs to have this, not just for on their shelves, but actually to read and partake. It is life changing. But, you know, you write to two sets of people in this book. It's for the Christians and for those who have been excluded. Can you explain that? I do, because I think that oftentimes we tend to view ourselves as the insider and we view those who aren't a part of our faith community as the outsider. World is divided into us versus them. And I think the responsibility that lies upon us as people of faith is to cross those barriers and boundaries and borders and to take the message of Jesus into places where it hasn't been heard and demonstrated. I love what Tom has said here on a couple of uh, occasions already in the interview that ours is the good news. The gospel is the good news, but ours is a show and tell gospel. Sometimes the showing part is absent. And when the showing part is absent, the telling part isn't heard. So I really want to encourage people to embody the love of Jesus, not just simply talk about it, not memorize and quote the scriptures to others, certainly not to weaponize it, but to fully embody the love of Jesus in a way that empowers them to cross lines, to connect with others for the sake of their salvation. You use the woman at the well so beautifully. And if you wouldn't mind, just over the next few moments, bring that story to life for us. And what did God speak to you for us today using that scripture? I have long been fascinated with this story that we find in the Gospel of John chapter four for a couple of reasons. 
Uh, first, it is the longest recorded conversation that Jesus has with anyone in the scriptures. So that in and of itself should tell us something. We know he had a lot of conversations. We know he was asked a lot of questions. In fact, Jesus was asked 113 questions in the Gospels, and he only answers two of them. So he's highly engaged, but he doesn't allow the culture to control the conversation. And then we find him in the Gospel of John chapter 4, out of a place where ordinary Jews might typically be found. He was in Samaria. And the backstory between the Jews and the Samaritans was one of brokenness and hostility. There were religious divisions. There were uh, deep sexual wounds. As generations earlier, invaders had come into the land, had intermingled with the people of God. And as a result, you ended up with a whole generation of people that were the Samaritans. And so there was an identity crisis, a lot of confusion and trauma. And Jesus chooses this place to have this rich conversation with a woman. He doesn't avoid any of the hot button topics of the day. And I love this because if you look at it, they talk about things like uh, ethnicity, race, uh, gender shows up in here, sexual history and brokenness. I mean, he covers all of the topics that our parents told us not to talk about with polite company. And yet he does that in a way that is kind and civil and winsome. And instead of repelling her from the gospel, he draws her in to the heart of God. Well, this results in her going back to the village and telling the village, come see this man who told me everything about me. Jesus then goes into the village where he spends two days in Sychar. We don't know what he did there. These are two days off the grid, two days missing from his itinerary. I often wonder if this is where he first heard the story of the Good Samaritan, or at least conceived of it. But what we do know is that this begins his love affair with the Samaritan people. And all through his ministry, Jesus is reaching to them, to the other. There's one moment when the disciples get frustrated because the Samaritan village rejects him and they want to call down fire on it as if they could. And Jesus says, no, these are my friends. And all this culminates in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascends into heaven and tells the disciples, I want you to go to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. Judea. And by the way, don't forget my friends, the Samaritans. So this one conversation begins this long, rich, and abiding love affair that gives us the example of how to reach people unlike us. We don't need a better model. Jesus is the model. He's a model for cultural engagement, and he's the model for personal evangelism. Pastor Terry, I love how you unpack that. Begs the question then, who's the Samaritans for us? Who are we? We don't have uh, actual Samaritans in, in, our, you know, in our culture right now. How do you uh, apply that to our present day? I think the Samaritans are predominantly those that are unseen, unheard, overlooked, and pushed to the margins of life. And the truth is, Tom, we might even have Samaritans in our own lives, right? Because even in our own families, we have divisions, we have polarization, we have a generation of young people that are questioning their faith, and many of them have, have deconstructed their faith. So even in the context of a Christian family, a pastor's family, a family of faith, we might have people that aren't quite as connected and, and relationally intertwined as they once were. So we live in a world of others in a thousand different ways. And we must be mindful of the fact that from their vantage point, we are the other which means that we can live with polarization and division, or we can make the decision that we're not going to other people, but we're going to one another other people. So there's the contrast in the epistles. Paul talks frequently about one anothering people. We're all going to either other people, which is label and define and reject and categorize them, or we're going to one another them, which means that we're going to love them and show them kindness and compassion. And that may even result in having some courageous but not contentious conversations, right? Mm -hmm. 
because we we could just kind of clean it up here and pretend that we don't live in a real world, but we do. We we have deep seated beliefs, and as people of faith, we believe the truth of scripture and we believe it is timeless and relevant and applicable and it's not up for negotiation so we have deep-seated beliefs and yet we can share those in a way that are loving and kind and compassionate right. i think that all people are worthy of respect all people are worthy of being heard all people are worthy of hearing the truth without insult and all people are worthy of unconditional love and if we could just sort of adopt those four things within our lives, it might help us to be positioned to really share the love of Jesus more effectively. You know, well, Amanda, before you ask, yeah. that was so profound. Could you just repeat those four things again? I don't want to miss that. I don't want our viewers to miss that. All people are worthy of respect. All people are worthy of being heard. All people are worthy of hearing the truth without insult, and all people are worthy of unconditional love. And this is what we see in this conversation that Jesus has with this woman, this woman who is, by the culture, largely unseen, unheard, and pushed to the margins. Mm -hmm. So who do we pass by every single day who is worthy of love and respect, of hearing the truth without insult, mm -hmm. and of being unconditionally loved? I think we pass by a lot of Samaritans every yes. single day. Yes. Amen. So well said. You know, this, I just have to read this because you bring up about empathy, kind of versing compassion, but really they're not versing each other. They go together. And it says, if empathy is the awareness of human suffering, compassion is its active companion in the trenches, rushing to their aid, coming alongside them, serving them in their distress. Will you just talk about that word? compassion because you go into the Greek, the Hebrew, and the importance of having compassion the way Jesus did. Empathy says, I feel with you. Sympathy says, I feel for you. Pity says, I feel sorry for you, but compassion says, I'm willing to act for you. So we see this throughout the Gospels that Jesus was moved with compassion. Compassion is the motivating factor or should be the motivating factor in the heart of every single Christian, whether it comes to evangelism or to doing works that are pre-evangelism, because we do those things as well, right? Not every conversation leads to salvation, but a sandwich might lead to salvation. A blanket might lead to salvation. A bottle of water might lead to salvation. So a lot of those things are pre-evangelism. And pre-evangelism, acts of compassion, come from this deep place of revelation. Fundamentally, we know that we were all strangers to God. We were all Samaritans relative to God. But he loved us. He came for us. He rescued us. And in being loved much, we should love much Compassion is the expression of that love. Amen. You know, uh, Pastor Terry, as I think about this, I think about, uh, you don't know this, but Amanda and her husband are the founders of the Pittsburgh Dream Center here, which serves oh. food, goes and adopts a block, cleans up blocks in the neighborhood and does so many things like that where they are uh, showing they're active in, in what they do. And I, I, just, I just love that ministry. But let me ask you about, uh, I, I wanna uh, unfortunately have to dive into something that's contentious already and will be contentious as we go. And that is the political realm. Um, I'm glad for Christians to be very involved in the political realm, but it has led to almost a substitution of that for the gospel, it seems like to me probably not in most people's minds. How do we navigate this, especially with family and friends that have differences of opinion? I think we have to consistently be reminded that the responsibility for setting the tone in cultural engagement rests upon us. So a lot of times I hear people in these very heated conversations, these intense and vitriolic debates, and the justification for that is, yeah, but they, 
they, they, they, they're trying to change us. They're infringing on our liberties. And those things, I think, in some cases are absolutely true. So I'm not diminishing that. But I think the responsibility to set the tone in a culture rests with the people of God, not with the people who don't know God the way that we do. And I think when it comes to all of us, we have to be reminded consistently and to remind ourselves that we are citizens of a higher kingdom, that we can be involved in the kingdoms of man. We should be involved in the political system, but we should do that from a different stance than does the people of the world. I watch it what happens as people on the far right are lobbing grenades at people on the far left and people on the far left are lobbing grenades at people on the far right. And I think most people are just stuck in the middle of that. They hear the tone being set and they mirror that. They amplify that. We're just, we're following the models that have been set for us. But what could happen if parents and pastors and leaders and television hosts and all of us collectively said, we're going to change the tone. We're going to change the tone. I don't think that uh, people mind a gentler tone. If I think, in fact, I think there are a lot of people who are turned away from the gospel, not because of the content of the gospel, but because of the tone in which we deliver it. So what if we just change the tone in our conversations without compromising the truth? I think that alone would go a long way. So true. Thank you for those beautiful words of wisdom. I'm just thinking about this moment in time that you had with Pope Francis, and I am wondering what that conversation looked like and what transpired out of that. I've had the privilege to meet with him two years in a row and it's been really fascinating. I found him first of all to be a brother in Christ, uh, one who loves Jesus. He is open to the Holy Spirit. In fact, the first time I met with him two years ago, he largely wanted to talk about the work of the Spirit, which was surprising to me. And I found that two-hour conversation really enjoyable. We followed up with the second meeting there in Rome this past year. And as a Protestant, as an evangelical, as a fifth-generation Pentecostal pastor, uh, I come from a very different place than the Pope does on a lot of different issues. But I think it's a beautiful picture of what it means to unite around what we do agree upon. So many times in the world today, we just look for those points of disagreement and we magnify them. And then we end up preaching Christ in contention. And this happened, of course, in the New Testament church as well. Paul mentions in Philippians 1 that you can preach Christ in contention and it leads to division. So the right message in the wrong spirit produces a bad outcome, but the right message delivered in the right spirit produces freedom. Mm -hmm. And if we can just find those points of agreement, whether it is with uh, people who are Protestants or Protestants with Catholics or evangelicals with Pentecostals or all of us with the world around us, then relational building sets the context for the flourishing of the gospel. The gospel flows along the lines of relationships. And everywhere I go, whether it's with Muslims or Hindus or people of like precious faith with me, I'm looking to make connections and build bridges so the gospel can flow along the lines of those relationships. Amen. Well, Pastor, we would so appreciate you to just pray over all of us, our viewing audience, because we all need to walk in that compassion and become the bridges compared to the wall. Thank you. I'd be honored to. Well, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Tom and Amanda. I thank you for the entire team there at Hope Today and this network. And I thank you for every viewer that is engaged with us. Lord, I think we all want to do this life in a way that pleases you, in a way that glorifies you, and in a way that reaches as many for you as we possibly can. Would you help us? Would you sensitize our spirits? Would you forgive us for anger and hostility and the way that we've used the gospel for uh, domination and to win? 
rather than to see people surrender. Lord, I pray that out of this moment in our history, we would not only see a new pathway forged for our nation, but I pray, Lord, that the people of God would embrace a brand new mission. We don't need a better model. You've given us Jesus who embodied grace and truth, not one at the compromise of the other. Help us to do both. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So well prayed. We thank you for your time today. And I believe everybody needs to get their copy of Loving Samaritans. Thank you again, Pastor Terry, for being with us. It's been an honor. Amen. Well, when we return in 60 seconds, we'll take a look at what the Bible has to say about loving one another. We'll be right back. Tom, what you doing? Oh, I can't find anything good on YouTube to watch. The commentaries, the blogs, the tier videos, the gaming videos, it's all boring. Oh, have you thought about subscribing to Cornerstone's YouTube channel? Cornerstone has a YouTube channel? Of course it does. Hold on, taking a pause to remind you to subscribe to our channel. Hit that like button and ring that bell for notifications. Now back to the video. I'll show you how to subscribe. Just search for Cornerstone Television Network and hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date getting filled with the Holy Spirit with consistent uploads every day. Keep up with your favorite moments and never miss a beat. Will you help us as we race to 100,000 subscribers? We can't do it without your help. The content is never ending with countless hours of entertainment. So subscribe to the Cornerstone YouTube channel today. Hope happens here. What a great conversation with Pastor Terry Christ and uh, so much about loving one another, loving those that are maybe on the outside, maybe across uh, country borders or maybe just across societal borders that we've sort of erected ourselves. Uh, Jesus spoke with someone about the importance of this in Luke 10, 27. I want to share that with you now. The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now this is the man that is talking with Jesus who said these things. So I want to back up. I want to find out what happened right before that. And uh, what it is, just a couple of verses before Amanda, this is amazing. It says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And here's what Jesus does there. He doesn't answer it. He asks him a question. Isn't that a key thing for us? Listen, to this. he says, what is written in the law and how does it read to you? And then it goes into the verse we just read. Now, what is so interesting about that to me is that here is Jesus with a ripe person to answer. You know, and, and to lay out, just lay out the truth. He could just lay it out 100%. But instead, he says, how does it read to you? He asks a question. Asking questions are such an important part of us connecting with people today. We can and we should proclaim the gospel. That is our, our right, our privilege, and our duty to proclaim the gospel, to share boldly and without reservation to everyone. But you know what's great is when we have the opportunity, the opening to do that, rather than just sort of uh, blasting someone who's not ready. By asking questions, you begin to see that opening. Jesus did it, so why don't we maybe do that as well? Let's ask some questions. When people challenge us, they may challenge us aggressively. I'll tell you what, asking them a question and asking for their input is a way to diffuse that situation right away, to bring love into the conversation, to bring love into the equation. And then maybe, and I'll bet you will, have an opportunity to share the truth and the good news of the gospel. That's so true. And you know what uh, Pastor Terry had said, even about being a good listener, it's so important. And Jesus was a good listener in that moment to hear the woman at the well. And, you know, I am amazed that that is the longest conversation yeah. 
in the New Testament with, know, with Jesus. Yeah. yeah, and the reality, you know, in another chapter of the book, it recaps and it says, won't you be my neighbor? <laughs> but it's talking about the outcome of that story. And I just want to read because this is so important. When we do and are led by the spirit of the living God and where the spirit is, there is freedom in that place. So if we can allow the Holy Spirit, his fruit to be bared in our life, and that's having patience with people, freedom is present. But it says in John 4, just again talking about the woman at the well, many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to say to them, to stay with them and he stayed with them for two days and because of his words many more became believers they said to the woman we no longer believe just because of what you said now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world i mean when we realize her life she became an amazing evangelist in that moment and the village got to know and believe in jesus can you, I mean, when we, do we truly appreciate the freedom that Jesus Christ, you know, has in our lives? Because I want that for other people. And when you think about she was present with the Lord, she didn't fall over. She was present with the Lord and yet she received that grace and mercy in the middle of her sinful state. And that's the type of God that Jesus is. He isn't an angry God who is ready to knock you out when you've made the wrong decision. No, instead, he is a compassionate, loving father who wants to listen to you and who wants to heal every wound, even deep within you. So I encourage you today to turn to him. He uh, desires to do such a work in us. Absolutely. I, I just want to continue that that uh, that line of thinking is that Jesus is asking you a question today. He is asking you, uh, who is your Lord? Have you made that commitment? Have, are you following me? Uh, you know, there's so many things that can get in the way of us following the Lord. There's so many cares of the world. There's so many cares that are proper and, and, and right cares of our job and of our community and of our family. But don't let any of those things get in the way of the one decision you need to make more than any other, the decision to follow after Christ and to continue. Some of you have made a, a you've prayed a prayer and you've accepted the Lord and that is the beginning, that is the start. You've become born again. But now it's following after him, following after him to the ones right around you that need to know him and maybe the ones across a border, a wall, that need to know Jesus and you are the one who will bring them that good news.